Okay, I gather people are, are joining us little by little, but let's make a start. I'm Duncan McCargo, and um, I'm very happy to invite you uh, to join us for the second day of this year's Thailand Update Conference. As I mentioned yesterday, we've been running a version of this conference since 2015. Uh, typically in the past, we did an overview of different topics, uh, a bit of economics, a bit of society, a bit of media, a bit of justice, a bit of politics. Um, today, uh, and yesterday we decided for 2021 really to focus the Thailand update on political protest, which was such a huge theme of what was going on in Thailand last year with the emergence of the protest movement. So we started off yesterday with a more historical context on the issue. We had a conversation with Tong Shui Wen Shikun and his, his very important new book, Moments of Silence. And then we heard from uh, Tyrell Habakon and Project Gongirti about um, the historical context of protests. We are now today going to talk about the phenomenon of the 2020 protest movement. Um, and we've got four papers here. And I should just say these are four papers that all appear in a special section of Critical Asian Studies, um, well-known journal. And if you want to look at the papers, please do a search, Critical Asian Studies latest articles, and you'll see some of them available online there. Uh, all four of them are actually out. If they're behind a paywall and you want to get to them, please let us know. So uh, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Petra Desitova, who's also with me at the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies here in Copenhagen. So uh, NIAS, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, is co-hosting the Thailand Update this year, along with the Weather Heady Station Institute at Columbia and the New York Southeast Asia Network. So I'll pass over to Petra to introduce the speakers for the first session. Thanks a lot, Petra. Thank you, Duncan, for the introduction. Um, well, welcome to the webinar. I'm really pleased that I have the honor to introduce our first two speakers. We have made a quick change in the program. So we will start off uh, with um, Dr. Sawani Alexander. So she will be speaking first, followed by Dr. Ayn Simpeng. So to introduce Dr. Alexander, she's an assistant professor of sociolinguistics at the Faculty of Liberal Arts at Ubon Ratchathani, uh, Ratchathani University in Thailand. She studies Thai politics from sociolinguistic perspective with special interests in street politics ordinary people's involvement in Thai politics and political resistance. Um, her contribution to the special issue has been an article titled Isan's People's Involvement in Thailand's Youth-Led Protests in 2020. So over to you, um, Dr. Alexander. Thank you very much, Petra, for the introduction. And uh, so uh, my paper is actually um, with a different title, not this particular one, but it doesn't really matter. You just, you know, um, uh, as Duncan has said, you can just uh, Google Critical Asian Studies latest papers. And um, so you'll find some of our papers there. So um, for today's talk, I'm gonna be only uh, focusing on just one aspect of the, you know, involvement which is the um, participation in protests hosted in Isan or Northeast, uh, Northeastern Thailand. Um, the paper itself um, in the Critical Asian Studies would be uh, talking about participation of Isan people in protests in Bangkok as well. So um, let's get started. This is my first presentation online, so please bear with my clumsiness. The title of this talk is Isan People's Involvement in Thailand's Youth-Led Protests in 2020. Um, and uh, so let's get um, to the very first slide. Uh, political struggles of Isan people. Um, why this region, as a lot of us who have been observing Thai politics are probably well aware of, um, this region is uh, very politically significant. Um, throughout the history, um, there have been a lot of struggles against the state, um, either for inclusion or exclusion of any kind. So we can refer to some of um, the examples like the Millenarian rebels, also known as the Holy Man rebels at the turn of the 20th century 
um, that took place around 1901, 1902. Um, that one got suppressed very harshly. A lot of people were killed and, you know, history written in such a way that those people were stupid and gullible, believing in things that, you know, were not real and impossible to come true. And uh, then we, um, during the Cold War, we see the communist insurgencies. Uh, we saw those communist villages um, marked as red, um, waiting to be co-opted or suppressed um, thanks to the help of the United States and um, helping the Thai elites fighting off the um, so-called communist um, now they call it terrorists at that time. Anyway, so again, that was, um, you know, we saw the success of the establishment in um, suppressing uh, people who disagree with the state. And then we, we um, kind of things were quiet for a while. And then we had the 2006 coup that removed Thaksin Chinawat from power. And we started seeing some resistance in Isan and elsewhere, um, the formation of the red shirts. And uh, in 2009 and 2010, we saw a lot of protests and the protests in 2010 um, ended violently with a crackdown, the fatal one by um, the military on the red shirts. And it, if you could see the image that I share here, that was, taken on, if I'm not mistaken, it was May 17, um, a dead body of an Ubon Rajatani man uh, was brought from Bangkok to Ubon and a lot of people gathered in front of um, the Ubon Rajatani City Hall in protest of the um, violent um, dispersals in Bangkok. So, um, and then we saw another, um, bout of resistance after the coup, but this time it was not that, you know, um, strong um, because uh, there was a lot of uh, suppression, harsh ones. And uh, also I published um, a book chapter on that. Um, if you're interested, we can, you can email me and ask. So, um, and then we see uh, resistance now, um, Another round of struggles, um, also in Isan and um, as you know, in Bangkok as well. So we've seen a lot of, you see a continuation of, of struggles, of resistance that people from this region uh, have been, um, you know, um, joining in, um, in demanding certain things from uh, the Bangkok based elite. So moving on to the next slide, because this will be, um, we will focus on just, you know, what happened in 2020 and how Isan people were involved in those um, struggles. So the very first protest uh, took place on January 12th. It was Wing Lai Lung, and uh, it was hosted in several parts of the country, especially in the North and Northeast, and primarily in Bangkok and um, neighboring provinces. It was the very first kind of um, big protest um, since the coup. And the demand was the resignation of Bayutan Osha and also his allies. And, you know, we, we started hearing talks of the constitutional amendments then too. And um, so um, surprisingly, there were a lot of people uh, joining the protest and you see a wide range of people from different ages and socioeconomic backgrounds and um, for that particular event you saw visible support from politicians and also red shirt activists they were back you know in um, straight politics back then and the note the handwritten note that you see now was written by um, a red shirt who was very sick in a hospital. She couldn't talk. Um, so, but, you know, given the fact that she was not able to talk, she was that sick, but she was still following politics. That spoke volumes about how these people were so passionate about politics. And um, yes, she wrote, 
you know, the, the notes actually was written in the Thai script, but, you know, it was like based on East, the Isan language. And uh, so basically it translates that tomorrow, all of us in the hospital will run to oust uncle, the uncle. So um, sadly, she was not able to join it. And just a few days later, she passed. So, um, so that was um, pretty tragic. Now, um, moving on to, um, I think it was the beginning of the protests, um, the campus protests that started late in February and continue on until sometime in March, mid-March 2020, because at the end of, towards the end of March, the um, government started to use the emergency decree um, used to kind of stop the spread of COVID-19. Anyway, so during that time, it was about one, one month, uh, we had student-led protests in various provinces. And uh, we saw mainly students, but also non-students protesters coming to join students on campus. The main demand was still, you know, resignation of Prayut Jan Osha and, you know, whatever change in the government that people were asking. And um, so, and, and the, you know, one of the main reasons or the catalysts was the um, the dissolution of Future Four Party, which is very popular among, you know, uh, students. Now, um, so the emergency decree and other measures, social distancing measures and all other things that the government was doing at the time kind of stopped, kind of silenced all the kind of protests that started to gain momentum. And, and so when the economy was so bad and made a, a lot of demands for, you know, the government to open, you know, up for more social gatherings, um, the government started to kind of ease some measures in uh, April, oh, sorry, um, March and, and Ju uh, May, um, sorry, May and June and July. So in July, we started, June and July, we started seeing some protest activities. In East we started seeing street protests of various size. And um, so what I'm, I'm, I'm showing here is between June and end of October, 2020, which was the, peak of the protests also in Bangkok and in Isan. We saw street protests of different, you know, uh, several hundreds. And you see students and non-students and no, now no uh, visible support from politicians, just, you know, people. The demands were resignation of Prayut and allies, of course. And we started seeing, you know, from signs and speeches on the protest um, stage, a monarchical reform and also new constitution and other causes. So what you see is the October 17 protest um, in Ubon Rajatani. That was about a thousand people and it was raining. Still people brave the elements in the rain uh, to join the protest. It was right after the dispersal in Bangkok as well. And so people were very emotional, people were very angry. They, you know, even yelled at the police officers, um, you know, coming to try to stop the protest. So here are some pictures from, from those protests. So this one on the left is October 19. That is the um, roundabout in Ubon Rajatani. That too garnered about a thousand people, mostly um, young protesters. And the one on the top right, October 16, on campus at Ubon Rajatani University, you see the typical, uh, you know, three finger salute. Um, there I saw like faces of those students who never showed up and, but they were so angry with the protests, um, the dispersals in Bangkok on that very same night. And the top right um, picture at the bottom, oh, sorry, um, the bottom right picture was July 19, 2020. As you can see in that particular protest, people were kind of asking about, you know, um, enforced disappearances, demanding um, justice for those who disappeared. That was very interesting because that kind of um, made a reference to some other, um, you know, cases that happened, um, you know, before to political activists. And um, so some pictures again from, um, this is from Mahasarakam on October 4th, 
I believe, and it was hosted on the campus of Mahasar Kam University. Here you see students and also Richard protesters. They invited some of the Richards to the state and also you know, um, paid respect to those who fought before. So that was kind of some kind of um, effort for bonding with um, activists who, um, you know, pro protested um, before 2020. And um, then you started seeing a decline in sizes um, as we uh, see between November and December 2020. Um, this coincides with a growing number of arrests of key leaders and the increasing police brutality in dispersal, the use of tear gas, the use of force, and the use of, you know, water cannons infused with who knows what. And uh, also legal charges against local provincial leaders, which was kind of unusual. A lot of people, at least seven of, of them in, in um, the Northeast um, got charged with either Article 112 and 116. And what you see here, oh, I'm sorry, um, on the right here is a protest in Ubon Rajatani. Not very many people, it was in December, um, that was when, you know, um, things were very tense and we got news from Bangkok that a lot of um, leaders were charged with several offenses. Um, so that was kind of demoralizing, but I think people were just waiting to see what happened. And so I want to end my presentation with this image from February 20th. Um, that was a protest in front of the Mueang Khon Gan uh, police station. People um, they kind of struggle early on between the uh, police and also the protesters. You see on the left uh, a line, several lines uh, of um, police. Um, you know, call for as we know it. I don't know what the term is in English, but you know, well equipped police officers ready. Um, you know, to disperse the people. And also the man sitting in the middle here is Atapon Buapat, one of the key leaders um, of Isan protesters, negotiating with high ranking police officer, demanding the release of the leaders in Bangkok who were, you know, arrested and detained without bail. So the demand right now is to ask for, um, the the court and the uh, justice system to respect the rights of these you know people charged with less majesty or serious charges just so they can have bail just so they can be outside just so their constitutional rights are respected so what we're seeing here is probably smaller sizes of protesters and uh, probably virtual protests you know but I think people, again, you know, I want to reiterate that they're just waiting to regroup again and wait for some form of triggers for them to come back to the streets. Because in Thai politics, you expect the unexpected. So thank you very much. That's just my presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was really good and brilliant timekeeping as well. So without further ado, um, we can move on to our second speaker. But um, I should probably also mention that for those of you who have questions, feel free to send them, but use the Q&A function of the Zoom rather than the chat. So we'll be collecting the questions um, in the Q&A function and we will be having obviously time to ask after the second speaker has um, delivered their presentation. So let me now introduce Dr. Ayn Simpeng, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of um, Government and International Relations at the University of Sydney in Australia. She is the author of a very recently published book by the University of Michigan Press, so it was just released this year. The title is Opposing Democracy in the Digital Age, the Yellow Shirts in Thailand. And I should also mention that uh, for those of you interested, this book is currently on sale and um, it sells for $21 and you can use uh, a special discount code to get 
further discount on that. Um, the discount code is UMS21. I'll try to post that into the chat. I'm not sure if you will be able to see that, but if not, we can always get back to it later on. Um, Dr. Simpeng is also a co-editor of a recently published book that has um, been published by ISEAS Press in 2020, and it's titled From Grassroots Activism to Disinformation, Social Media in Southeast Asia. Uh, today's presentation is titled Hashtag Activism and the Free Youth Protests. So over to you, Dr. Simping. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me. And thank you, Ajahn Sawani, for going first. Um, so today I'm talking, since I wasn't able to be in Thailand uh, at the time of the protests, um, I follow it heavily on social media. So today's talk is based on my research on Twitter. I got interested in looking at how Twitter was used for to the 2020 protests was because it was actually the first time uh, that Twitter was used on a large scale uh, to facilitate um, a mass pro-democratic protest in Thailand. It was the, the first time for a large scale mass protest. So the some people who had been using uh, Twitter before probably was surprised by this, but actually Twitter in Thailand uh, had always been for a long time, mostly used for entertainment and K-pop. And it wasn't uh, until 2019 when the Future Forward Party really capitalized on the growing number of new users in Thailand uh, on Twitter that it had been used for political purpose. But even then in 2019, Twitter still was majority not used for political mobilization or, or politics in general. And it only became significantly uh, important as a tool for communication on politics last year. And I, so the protest last year really brought Twitter onto the fore as a, now a critical tool for political mobilization for the very first time. And, but up, up until then, uh, Twitter was, was, was not really a main tool for political mobilization. It was mostly Facebook uh, and to, to some extent line. Uh, but Twitter this round was really important. So I got interested in looking at Twitter and particularly uh, the hashtag uh, free youth or Yawashon Put Act in Thai. So the three quick key questions I was interested in initially was, um, you know, what was the role of Twitter in general in terms of how it was used for the protest last year? And what was it really used for, right? We had this idea that Twitter probably was used for mobilization, but that should have been a hypothesis, not an answer. We don't really know how it's used. So, um, Free youth was, um, when you look at the most popular hashtags used for all of Twitter in Thailand in 2020, political ones uh, in 2020, basically where the hashtag actually end up in the top 100 uh, hashtags used for the whole year. And you look at the political hashtags that were used. Free Youth or Yawashon Put App was the most popular hashtag, uh, political hashtag in Thailand for the whole year last year. And it actually became the top trending hashtag twice. It was the only hashtag used uh, by protesters that uh, was trending in the top, uh, most popular hashtag twice in, in the whole year. So I decided to look into this, the role of this hashtag in particular in potentially driving activism in Thailand. So the data that I look at was based on a randomly extracted data of about 28,000 tweets that use, um, that use Yawashon Blood Act as the, the, the hashtag um, based on the data from January 1st, 2020 till August 31st, 2020. And then about 15% of the data was subsequently manually analyzed for content. So what did I find? 
Uh, first, I found that the main motivations for using hashtag free Yabushan Blood Act was actually not to mobilize for protests, which was surprising, was actually to express grievances. This was but almost seven, nearly 75% of the, the tweets analyzed that used this hashtag was basically to complain. Uh, it was not, uh, it was less used to disseminate information and even less so to mobilize protests. So what what's this suggests, at least with the data that I'm looking, I was looking at, was that the, the hashtag was primarily used um, by people to talk about, you know, why they may be supportive of uh, what had been going on in Thailand, what had, has been going on in Thailand, you know, why they were upset with the government or why they wanted to support the free youth movement or other similar uh, youth-led uh, protests in Thailand, and not necessarily to give uh, information on the protests, uh, or to motivate others to go to the offline protests. Uh, and this is, this is important as a finding because Twitter as a platform, it, its functionality is, is specifically designed to be really good at motivating live events like protests. So to see that the hashtag itself wasn't actually used to uh, to help with the mobilization as much, or even disseminate information about the protests, even upcoming protests, as much as it was actually used to air grievances, uh, signify that it seemed to be the kind of hashtag used to build solidarity or almost identity around what it means to be part of the free use uh, broader movement or protest movement in general. And that potentially the number of people that we witnessed showing up at the offline protest sites uh, were not, uh, uh, were just a small number of people who were engaged in a broader sort of push towards this discontent against you know, the system, the government or what have you. So the number of people showing up Using, using the hashtags at the offline protests couldn't account for the much, it seems like a much bigger number of people who were using these hashtags over the course of eight months in 2020. So then I dig deeper and trying to figure out, you know, what were the key narratives within those hashtags that use them for grievances? And uh, bro I broke these down into different categories. Some of them overlap. Um, there's multiple categories counted. But the, the, big, the big motivations for using hashtag Yawashon Plotag or for you was to, to talk about democracy or the lack of democracy in Thailand, uh, to express why they oppose the current government. Uh, government position is 33%. Uh, to discuss topic about topics relating to youth rights, you know, youth should have uh, should 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 have their rights respected as equal citizens to other people. Um, there should be more atten uh, attention paid to what the the young people really want and need. So that's twenty percent. Um, Complaints about the education system or discussion about how the education system could be improved accounts for about 9%. And far less important uh, in terms of motivations for using hashtag free youth was to discuss the state of the economy. And the least important the, or the least frequently found was to discuss the monarchy. It was way at the bottom. So the, the, the three key narratives within the grievances of people using free youth hashtag was to talk about democracy, talk about why they oppose the government and discuss youth rights.
So some of the example, this, these are the two most popular, one, the two, some of the most popular tweets that, that I found here. I hope that our society can change for the better, for our future and the future of the next generation. Thank you to everyone who came out today. Let's keep on fighting, long live democracy is really common. Long live democracy was a very common phrase that was used. If the students force the teacher to have a particular haircut, what would they say? This is too much, deadline to dictatorship and also hashtag free youth. Um, the final analysis was to have a better sense of potentially identifying influencers that were using the hashtags a lot, but also were connected to other users in the networks of people that use this hashtag. So initially I had expect um, the official, official account of, of Yavashon.io free you to show up as the key influencer because they would be pushing that hashtag that also has the same name as the as the group, or even the people behind the free youth group, which is, you know, someone like uh, Tate might show it up. But in fact, what I found in the social network analysis was that the majority of what we could identify them as influencers within the free youth communities are actually were actually ordinary users. There was, you know, Prashad Thai here, um, Amarat Jeb, who's just a former uh, um, Fisher Forward MP, but everyone else, they were not celebrities, not, not someone known. Uh, they were just ordinary users who were using these hashtags a lot, but they also know a lot of people in the networks that also use these hashtags. So this suggests to me that there's some kind of decentralization going on with the networks of users that use free use hashtags, which uh, in some ways uh, map on to what the leaders of different groups within the protests, uh, broader protest movement in Thailand, I see wanted, was to have a more decentralized, less structured uh, kind of movement where ordinary users or ordinary people who use Twitter or, or not, they use something else, feel empowered that they, they can drive the conversation about, you know, why they're part of the, of the protest or what do they want uh, out of it. So this, uh, this network analysis seems to suggest that there is definitely decentralization going on, that the, the influence within the networks, at least on the Twitter networks, are not known individuals or, or, or the influential individuals, uh, which, you know, is a good thing uh, if the objective is to make a broader movement, you know, more personalized, individualized, something that ordinary people feel that they could be an important voice in. So um, in summary, uh, what my research has shown is that the uh, studying a hashtag, uh, an important hashtag over a longer period of time uh, within a broader protest give us some indication about the role that social media itself play uh, in uh, as a broader part of, of the protest. Because social media isn't everything, obviously. It's, it's, it's an important puzzle to understand, but we don't often understand how it's actually used and what what role it actually play in, in, in a protest. So Twitter is just one social media platform, but I argue here that it's a really important one, but a really important one, especially last year, because it was the first time that Twitter really played a critical role in political mobilization in Thailand for the very first time. And, and, and that's why I, I believe it's, it deserves special attention in, in studying it. Now, I only look at one hashtag, obviously, even though it's the most popular one used, so it has some limitation, but I think it gives some indication about, you know, why it was used, when it was used, and uh, how people were really using it. So it's really fascinating to see that Twitter actually play a role, more of a, uh, a play a role in building uh, the almost like identity of what a protest movement looked like online, because it was largely used to air grievances and express uh, feelings. 
about why they're part of this movement rather than just pushing out info about the protests or just driving people to go into offline activities. So going forward, um, obviously my data in, in, in August and there was a lot more protest movement, you know, especially in October last year, uh, something that I, I'm intending to update it uh, the data on, but I think going forward, this, oh, one of the key challenges that the protest group may face is to, you know, how do we capitalize on the energy or the uh, the community that they had had started to build on social media into something tangible offline, like something that could, could be more closely knit because the way the social network analysis shows me how decentralized the network seem to, to look like online may suggest that this is a story of kind of weak ties um, online that may also have an impact on the strength of alliances offline uh, across groups, but also of the, 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 the grassroots support of different groups that are part of the broader protest movement that may, um, may make it a challenge to continue to mount more offline mobilization because the ties that bind them were not very strong and were quite decentralized. So I'll just end my presentation there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation. And um, I can see that a few questions are already trickling in. If I could just reiterate, if you could please post your question to the Q&A or using the Q&A function rather than the chat, that would be great. Because um, that's where I will be able to clearly see. Okay, thank you very much again for the wonderful presentations and for the excellent timekeeping as we are left with actually quite a lot of time for questions. So without sort of um, further delay, I'd like to start with some of these questions. Um, there's actually a very interesting question about the significance of the term plot egg for the free, in terms of the, the free use rather than alternatives. Um, you know, it, is it, you know, what is it, why did the activists actually choose that term instead of some other expressions that you can use in Thai for the, for, for, for the word free? Me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't know. I, it sounds like a really old fashioned word too. It sounds like the feudal system or something. I'm not a linguist, so maybe somebody else can answer, but <laughs> it really caught on. There's like a, a whole, like a, so many foot act group coming out after that. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Even a linguist cannot answer this question as to why this. But, you know, remember back uh, 10 years ago when the Richard started using the term pride, it was like a kind of a reminder of how ancient our society is, you know, things like that. But but uh, it's more associated with, you know, that Cold War era when, you know, the kind of, um, you know, they were talking about blood ad and stuff. I honestly, I don't know. I don't know why it got kind of uh, caught on, fashionable and uh, very popular, but uh, these students are so creative in inventing new words that, you know, uh, that can can go viral. And and so it's not just, but uh, there are other terms as well that are really, really interesting. So we don't answer your question, but uh, we also find it interesting. I think there was one particularly interesting thing that you just mentioned, you know, the link to the Cold War. Is there any sort of um, link potentially that you could make with the actually free youth movement, you know, later on during the protest? I think it was October, November, maybe a bit later when they changed the logo and used some communist symbolism in that. I mean, would there be any, um, any connection in that or anything like that? I mean, could we talk about some potential ideological influence behind that? Yeah, that that kind of uh, that's interesting because um, as far as my observation can can tell me, I think that turned a lot of people off actually, 
Um, I think it has to do with the fact that there are several factions in the leadership and uh, it depends on who gets to post. I, you know, this is, you know, just my observation. I don't know if it is true or not, but this is what I've seen. It's like different, different moods, different uh, rhet rhetorical messages and different strategies. Um, when they posted that, you know, float ad or even um, the, the communist uh, symbols, uh, um, there were a lot of discussions among the pro-democracy uh, supporters um, as to whether it was appropriate to uh, kind of represent the movement um, in that light. Remember, um, even in the red shirts um, 20, um, 10 years ago, when, you know, there were a lot of factions and uh, one faction was uh, a group of former, um, you know, um, CPT, uh, people who later join the movement. And so, and, and, you know, there's always a friction and there's always some kind of misunderstanding or miscommunication among these groups. So, um, you know, I thought that um, true, some people kind of appreciate the ideology, uh, but you know, some people may not think it was a good strategy to um, to go with, given you know, and the time and uh, the um, political situation um, right now. Staying a little bit with the sort of um, you know historical theme, um, there is one question asking you know, compared to the student protests in the nineteen seventies. What are the strengths particularly of these student protests? And perhaps I would add, you know, what kind of weaknesses you would see um, as well? I think that question would be to both of you really. Amy, you wanna go first or you want me to go first? <laughs> Okay, this I can go first. Yes, um, since your mic is on, go ahead, Ajahn. Okay, ha. Huh. Um, you know, in the 70s, it was pretty clear, you know, what the goal was, that, you know. Um, Ajahn Tong Chai um, mentioned this yesterday when he was talking, uh, you know, comparing protests, student protests in the 70s. They were led by a clear ideology, uh, but right now, it was, um, you know, right now in 2020, at least, it was more like a response to many, many problems in a country, including, um, you know, um, imposition on uh, cultural um, propaganda and uh, a response to economic problems, response to, um, you know, suppression um, in the educational system. If you see some of the demands, some of the causes by different groups hosting the protest, you know, last year, for example, um, the Nakri and Lake group would focus on problems in the educational system, right? And then the general group uh, talking about, you know, the, um, the lack of, uh, you know, um, what is it? Um, I'm talking about the um, uh, the um, ineffectiveness of the government and um, the fact that the government is just a continuation of dictatorship from before the election. And uh, what we see now is a combination of so many different causes um, rather than a kind of a clear uh, dominant ideology too. Uh, a lot of people were talking about monarchical reform, but that just one, um, you know, one of the demands. So I think, you know, the protests in 2020 are kind of put together by um, different, um, different, what is it? Different groups, different people, uh, you know, um, fighting for different causes. Um, so, you know, to me, they're just um, very different from the protests or the struggles in um, 
among students in the 70s. Thank you. Aim, would you like to add some to the question how different let me cover cover my <laughs> answer okay well in that case let's move on to the next question and there's a lot of questions popping in here but one of them was quite interesting in terms of asking um obviously that was mentioned during um your presentation Bo, and that was a, a fact that since the new year the you know the the volume of, of this protest has actually dwindled and there was a question that in Konken, at least at the start of the new year, they still attracted a number of people, but then, you know, it also started to dwindle. What do you think, I mean, is there anything um, that could somehow re-electrify these protests? What would it take? What would be the kind of catalyst, especially for, let's say, the protests outside of Bangkok and in the provinces? That is an excellent question. Honestly, I don't know, but what I've seen in 2020 is that whenever there was something really bad and that, that made people really angry, they came to the streets, you know, they took to the streets. So I would say anything really bad in the eyes of the protesters or pro-democracy people, even people who are still reluctant, you know, you know that they took to the streets in 2020 was you know, something that was so bad that they couldn't put up anymore. And uh, we observers did not, a lot of us didn't even expect them. You know, we saw that a lot of people have been complaining since the coup, complaining online elsewhere, but they were too afraid, you know, to protest. But they happened in 2020 and uh, the protests could grow as big as, you know, getting a thousand people in the streets. So right now, what is happening in Bangkok, or what has been happening in Bangkok, as far as, you know, what the authorities have done, arresting a lot of key leaders, trying to silence, trying to kind of uh, deter further gatherings um, in whatever means they have, it's happening in the Northeast as well. We've seen more charges, more uh, suppression, more intimidation. And yes, while people are still, are still angry and still want to, uh, to go to the streets, um, a lot of people are waiting and, and seeing what's going to happen next. So I think if, if I'm right, if the pattern that I saw is what actually triggered these big protests. I think anything bad happening to protest leaders can get people to the streets, but I hope that I'm wrong, you know, because I don't want anything bad to happen to, to anybody, you know, um, but that's what happened in the past. And, and so, that will be a trigger. Or oh, you just wait and see. You don't know the economy is so bad. You know something would happen because I, as I said in my presentation, you know, just when you don't expect anything, just when you don't think that they, nobody's gonna, you know, risk their lives, uh, risk their uh, freedoms to uh, to protest against these powerful people who are, you know, becoming even more powerful, taking full control of the country. And that's when we are wrong, right? And that's when somebody starts, you know, protest and a lot of people join in. So. Aim, would you like to add something? What do you think would be the, the sort of potential catalyst that could revive some of these protests? Potential catalysts, more repression. People get angry they'll come out <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. any kind of uh, very abrupt decision to uh, shut down one social media platform would probably get people out. <laughs> so potentially shut down of Twitter or attempt to shut down Twitter would be about Or temporarily <laughs> unavailable or something that yeah. would get 
How about recently there's been um, an introduction, this is abusing me, my um, my powers at the moment, but there's been an introduction of, of a, um, a fairly new social media platform called Clubhouse. And there's already been, you know, government, um, the Prague government sort of going out in public and saying, well, you know, do not use this for political purposes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that potentially could become another avenue for, for maybe, you know, what you have described on Twitter, uh, you know, a platform for airing grievances or even for mobilization. You know what they say when you tell people not to do something, right? Um, anyway, um, <laughs> I just think people want to freely talk about something, especially things that they're probably not supposed to talk about. And it's just moving from one platform to another, you know, and I think uh, th despite what we think, the major social networking sites actually have better privacy settings than some of the smaller ones. But because they're under a lot more scrutiny from the media and from the government, uh, people felt that they don't have as much privacy. Uh, but And so they go to other less surveyed, less monitored uh, platforms, which actually have poorer security settings. Uh, but it's just this perception of, you know, what's being watched more and, and so forth. Uh, I just think it just happens in societies where there's just no freedom of information and people will seek out ways, digital or not, to talk about something they want to talk about. And I think what the, um, the uh, some of the leaders of the protest movement have shown last year was the audacity to talk about particular things that People have obviously been uh, talking about it for years, but just never out open the public, and that gave this this ability, this feeling, this permission to keep talking. And it's just a matter of moving from one platform to another. To be honest, I, I don't I don't think it's particular features of some platforms over others. I mean, yes, they may say you know, Clubhouse is audio only, but actually doesn't have as good a security privacy setting as Twitter. But again, people have this perceived sense they have more privacy, so they go there. And it's just the government uh, at the moment, what they can do is only, you know, to just advise, you know, and occasionally uh, say, you know, these things are, there are certain things that are, that are, that are against the law, that, uh, you know, things that can't be said that could potentially threaten national security, which is many things, uh, very broad sort of, Indeed. you know, warning, um, but people will talk what they want to talk. There's a very interesting question in the chat, and that's um, perhaps related to the transnational nature of the protests that we've seen. So uh, as we know, over the past um, few years, it wasn't just Thailand or, or the protests in Thailand, but there was a wave of protests in Hong Kong, for instance, now obviously um, Myanmar or, or Burma. And the question is, you know, um, what do you think about this transnational um, nature of the, these protests and the, the fact that these actually um, protests seem to be kind of, you know, learning from each other, they're sharing strategies. You could see that things that have been used in Hong Kong then have been adopted in Thailand, now they're being adopted in, in Myanmar. So what is your take on these and what significance perhaps does that have for future protests? If there are digitally mediated protests, oh, sorry, Adan, I go first. Oh, um, go ahead. Go if there ahead. are digitally mediated protests, right, uh, driven particularly by young people, uh, the, the, the key things are, you know, what is going to make it go viral? What's going to make it stand out in, the, in a social media sense, but also in a ways that will be picked up by traditional media? Those kind of strategies are, you know, can be learned, can be shared, because it's just about, you know, how can I push particular uh, topics on top, how can we get more people discussing uh, about this. So even timing the use of particular hashtags to get a mask so they can drive up traffic at the same time, those are things that that are that can be practiced in commonly, you know, in, in any kind of, of setting. Because what platforms do is they, yes, all the pro protests are unique. They're, they're local, you know, dependent local context, but because they use particular platforms all the same, there are certain functionalities that the platforms can offer that gives a leverage to, uh, to activists that are actually good on social media uh, to be able to use it to, to, to drive up their hashtags, to, to drive traffic uh, to get more visibility 
disability. So for example, you know, um, the rubber duck thing. Like a lot of people are like, what is that duck thing? <laughs> But if you think about it from the marketing perspective, it's very visual, visible, they're floating and cute. But the, you know, actually started in Serbia in 2015. Uh, so it's just like, it's visual, it's graphic, it's totally shareable, it's fantastic for going viral on social media and traditional media. And uh, at some point, I'm sure uh, some of some of the Thai experts uh, around the world here would keep getting asked about these ducks because that's what people remember, right? Like, so what's up with the ducks? I mean, journalists would always ask, what's with the ducks, right? What's with the, the hair water stuff? Because it's, the, the use of pop culture. So those are sorts of things that you can learn from each other. But also I think underneath it all, there's some, uh, there's this sense of mutual solidarity across some of the key uh, activists as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the Thai activists get giggly when, you know, Joshua Wang would retweet them. It's, it's this sense of, you get me, I get you, you support me, I support you and, and so forth with the, with, with the Myanmar. So there's that sort of, I think, um, share a sense of solidarity in, in that sense, but it's not, it's not in depth like they're on a conference call every day talking about strategies, but they're clearly mm -hmm. things that work on social mm -hmm. media and, and then they, they get reported on social media. So why not use it to their advantage? Yeah. Yeah, Ajahn Aim has covered a lot. I just want to add, you know, just a little bit. They get like solidarity, right? They learn techniques and strategies from one another, but that's still kind of virtual. I think, you know, what is more important is, you know, support from the country. Like, how do you reach out to people? People are excited about seeing ducks and stuff, you know, you know, all these protests get publicized and get a lot of attention from a lot of people. But where is the pressure? You know, you need a lot of pressure if you want to do street politics in order to make some change. And right now the establishment is learning, you know, to how to deal with, you know, these young protesters. So it is very interesting to see, you know, how social media or even support from, or strategies from other country would, you know, um, help you know, protesters in Thailand, but, you know, at this point, it just, you know, the, um, what is it, the Thai authorities are like, kind of indifferent towards, you know, whatever uh, protesters are doing. So um, that is worrying. And um, so uh, in a few months, we'll see what happens. And uh, let's hope that things don't es escalate to where it is just so bad, just like what's happening in, in Burma right now, so. Do you think that the situation in Burma could somehow help fuel the, 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 or refuel the protests again? Or is that more of a deterrent, obviously seeing how the military junta is reacting there and how they're dealing with it? What's the, what's the feeling on the ground really? From where I am, people are angry, but then again, you know, Thai people are just like, you know, you can vent your frustrations, you can complain a lot, but yeah, at the end of the day, you might not do anything. But again, like I said, it is also interesting that all of a sudden they can just go to the streets. If there is a leader, if somebody say, hey, let's do this. And all of a sudden, you know, um, like as an aim said, you know, make them angry, more suppression. So, but we don't know what form of suppression will wake people up again. So we just have to wait and see. And uh, seeing things that happen in Burma, it's just like people seeing what happened in uh, Tiananmen in China years ago, or what happened in Korea years ago, or what happened in in uh, Myanmar, uh, Burma, 20 something years ago. You know, all these things ha had happened before in history or things that happened. People today are talking about things that happened in 1976, October 6th. You know, they get emotional, they get passionate about things, but they might not do anything. So your question is waiting uh, for an answer, but 
you know, only protester can, can tell us, you know, what the answer will be. Um, is there anything on this one that you would like to add or shall we move on? Okay, there's another question um, and that's probably more um, for you, Boo, but that was a question about the unity between Bangkok or, you know, the pro protesters in Bangkok and protesters in Isan. So, you know, you know, are, are they, is there a degree of unity or do they want um, different things? Are there any, any, any gaps um, that can be bridged between protesters in the two regions? I think the main, um, you know, there's, of course, there um, a degree of solidarity, a degree of shared understanding of what, you know, real problems or real culprits of political problems are in Thailand. But I think um, people differ in um, strategies, in how to move forward, um, and um, degree of fear. Because as you, you know, early on or when, you know, the protests were reaching their peak in uh, October, um, you saw that many people in the streets, in Ubon, in Mahasarakam, in, in key provinces in, in Isan. But then as soon as they saw that the, what the government was willing and uh, to do in um, dispersing people, they started to think, you know, is this, um, you know, is this a good way, um, you know, to it's whether it is a good idea to move forward with some of the issues that the protester, the key leaders were talking about on the stage, like monarchical reform, you know, is it people started wondering if this is a good time to um, to move with this, or is it a good time to kind of step back and and talk about trying to remove um, actors in or, or leaders in the government. So, because um, remember, Isan people have been fighting for a long time and, um, and for various causes and some of the causes were very dangerous. And, you know, over a hundred people were killed, you know, in 2010 and a lot of people are still in jail. You know, people try to, at the end of the day, older protesters, people who've been fighting a long time, you know, have to think about their families, have to think about the uh, consequences of their sacrifices. And so, um, you know, it's not that they don't want to fight. It, it's not that they are afraid, but it is, you know, um, sometimes people have to think, about, uh, think twice about, you know, what uh, their priorities are and what they need to do now. So in terms of solidarity, of course, and I, I, you know, I think a lot of people um, understand fully what the younger protesters want and um, fully support them. But um, for them to come out openly and, and support them in that way, um, may be a bit of a challenge. So I think that's, that's what's happening now. Okay, well, thanks for that. That was a, an interesting analysis. Um, we've got two questions um, and I'm kind of going to bunch them together. So feel free to answer um, either of them. But one is related to the use of social media and whether that's creating generational gap. Because obviously the social media might have been used mostly by the younger or it seems, at least it seems like a tool for the younger generations rather than the older generations. So, you know, is it creating some sort of generational divide? That's the first question. And the second question is about gender. So have you really focused, I mean, gender has popped up during these protests um, in some ways as well. Um, so have you, have you been looking, I mean, I remember seeing some groups, I think they were protesting in Bangkok outside of the democracy monument, you know, asking for, for rights, abortion rights and things like that. So, you know, um, what is the role of gender perspective, if any, um, if you looked into that particular point? I'll answer the first question first. So okay. it depends on the platform. Um, Twitter potentially uh, heavily uh, geared towards younger people, uh, but not, uh, not Facebook. Um, do you see a more even distribution now of different age groups uh, on, on Facebook? 
uh, and, and I believe Line as well. Uh, Twitter, Twitter became really important uh, last year because in the past few years, uh, the, the uptake of Twitter uh, by young people in Thailand was the greatest. So age between 18 and 24. Uh, uh, were, were signing on to Twitter like en masse. Actually, Thailand became, um, has the highest growth of new users on Twitter in all of Southeast Asia, thanks to young people in Thailand. Uh, so definitely, and I think when you, uh, when you look at Twitter in particular, you start to see, uh, you're starting to wonder about the potential for division in the, in, in the, in a sense that in some ways, you know, it creates um, unity um, for people who, who understand, you know, what's going on with hashtag and to talk to your language, but it also can feel uh, alienating as well. And I think this is particularly the case uh, for the K-pop communities that, were, that are huge on Twitter in Thailand, that part of that community became supportive of the movement and the language is used uh, to discuss issues, you know, are really languages known to only K-pop members. I mean, I literally have to call my niece who's 12 and ask her like what it means because I, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand what, what's going on. And they're a big part of, of the protests, as, as you know, um, some of you might, might, might know that uh, K-pop fans were some of the biggest financiers of some of the street protests in Thailand. Uh, so part of that uh, could feel like it's a sense of, you know, building sort of commonality and grievances, but it could also be alienating uh, to some people that don't understand the language or just the way it, it works. I mean, you wouldn't be on Twitter probably. If, if, if you did join, you may or may not understand. So I, I don't think, I don't think that, well, obviously it's intentional to some extent, right? I mean, they, you know, this is how they tweet and they're not gonna change the way they tweet to expand the base support, like people use Twitter, this is how they tweet and that's fine. Um, you either take it or leave it, I think. But I think it, 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 for me, it suggests that I, I feel, I feel like the government didn't see this coming, like at least the political elites who are of an older generation didn't see this coming, especially out of Twitter, because I think there was this sense of being completely out of touch with the digital culture of young people. I mean, I feel a little out of touch because I also don't understand a lot of the languages. So there seems to be a bigger gap in, in, in the way at least the Twitter community communicates over protests that that, that I feel that the political elites didn't really get. I don't see that as much on Facebook. I think Facebook, pe people use it, you know, everyone, uh, lots of people use it. The gender, the gender uh, question is really interesting because in 2019, according to um, reports by Twitter, um, more than 70% of new Thai users on Twitter were female. Um, and I, I, I've not been in Thailand last year, but I've read report that some of the protests, especially the earlier ones, were heavily attended by women. Um, I don't know if um, mm -hmm. Somni, you, 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 you. I'll just pass this yeah. on to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first question. Uh, I think it's a matter of preferences. Um, Older people prefer line application, of course, you know, so what do you want when I'm gone, you know, in addition to their, you know, political news and rumors and uh, also Facebook and younger people prefer, you know, even Instagram or, um, you know, Twitter. So, but again, protest organizers or leaders use different platforms in spreading the news about protests. So younger people get news um, through Twitter or Instagram or Facebook and, and older people get the same news uh, on uh, through line and uh, you know uh, Facebook. So I don't think you know different social media platforms would you know divide people. It just you know this is what they use and um, and so as long as the news gets to you know um, oh, 
gets to people, I think, you know, people don't even think about whether, you know, oh, I don't know about this because it's on Twitter and stuff, you know, they don't complain, you know. Um, as for um, gender, yes, it's a very interesting question. And I've seen protests where larger ones would allow a lot of people to, you know, um, freely talk about causes they support. In one protest in Ubon, you know, people got to talk about, you know, uh, LGBT rights, and, you know, women's rights, rights to dress, you know, stuff like that. So um, I think we started seeing that, you know, in, in, in protests as well. Um, but I agree with Dan Aim, you know, based on my few observation, um, more than half, or let's call it um, um, three quarters of, uh, you know, of the protesters were um, women. And it has always been like this, even with the red shirts, you know, 10 years ago. So, but I, I you know, I, I, I don't see like, um, what is it like um, friction or complaints um, among these women who could be in the forefront, you know, um, in the front line, you know, confronting um, riot police and stuff, you know, they were doing exactly what men were doing during the protest. That was very interesting, you know, but uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, they get emotional, they get very feisty, they get very, um, angry and and so they kind of give like you know um, life um, to each protest. So it's a definitely that's my observation. Yeah, it's definitely fascinating yeah. to be talking about gender, and I wish we had more time to kind of, kind of go um, into more detail on this particular one, yeah. um, especially given the numbers yeah. sort of profile leaders who were female as well and who um you know were out there really being outspoken and shattered a lot of political mm -hmm. in Thailand as well oh, yeah <laughs> yeah the final question that I have is a question I mean there are a few questions um being posted so that's why I'm kind of touching upon this but it was a question asking you about what do you think the outside world the international community could do obviously Thailand is not a country that has a history of some sort of international interference in its domestic affairs but you know is there anything that you can see from your point of view what the international community could do in terms of you know wielding pressure perhaps on the government in, in, in some particular way. There was mention of potentially EU, the US. Um, so if you can take it from there. Oh, <laughs> difficult and good question. Um, again, I wanna stress, the, you know, this, this point that the success of the protesters would come from within Thailand, the pressure from within Thailand. Thai people have to depend on themselves in moving the country forward. But the international community can act as at least, you know, um, witnesses to things that happen in the country and stress um, whatever values that they profess to believe, to uphold. Say, for example, democratic countries should stress this point that they support democracy. And um, I think that's more than enough. And being here, observing things that happen and learning about, you know, um, what actually happened in the ground from different stakeholders and stuff. Keep doing what they've been doing, I guess, because asking them to do too much is, it's not, it's not viable. It's not, it's not possible. You know, each country would just want to protect its own interests, its people's interests. You know, um, nobody cares about, you know, somebody, you know, in a small village in, in Thailand who got, you know, who got put in jail for protesting in 2010, you know, but, you know, for the sake of humanity, for the sake of, you know, um, I'd say humanity, just be witnesses to these things atrocities, um, brutality that are happening in our country. So I think that's what they should do. I think we should keep the hashtag, what, what's happening in Thailand trending for the rest of this year? <laughs> <laughs> 
keeps everyone, you know, on their toes about what's going on. And it's the hashtag that's in English that a lot of Thai people use as well. So that's one way of basically keeping it in the news um, so that, you know, we can keep asking more questions. There could be more research about it. And it's a indirect, indirect pressure, but it's an important one. Definitely. I think you're right there um, when you obviously made those kind of assessments because there's always a danger and obviously that has been something that's been brought, you know, since day one that these were foreign funded protests as part of the criticism from the government. So I think there is a very thin line in the sense of maybe giving too much support could, could somehow help for the protesters to be discredited domestically by the governmental forces in that sense. So on that note, um, I think we've run out of time, but thank you both for a, a really interesting presentations and for um, you know, getting through with me through so many questions. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to answer all of them, but there were many more um, very interesting ones. And I could see that AIM has answered as many as she could as well on chat. So thanks a lot for that. And I hope that uh, all the participants enjoy this and are gonna stay for the following session um, that's continuation of, of this and also later on the um, um, networking event afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Petra. Um, welcome to the final panel of uh, this year's Thailand update. It is a great pleasure to uh, introduce the two speakers uh, that we will have in this session. Just as a reminder to everyone, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A uh, throughout, throughout the talks and we'll, we'll get to them all at the end. So the two speakers uh, in this session also have pieces in the special issue of Critical Asian Studies. So I urge you to go there if you want to, if you want to read more. The first speaker, Dr. Kanokrat Chusagun is assistant professor in the Faculty of Political Science at Chulalongkorn University. She's the author of both The Rise of the Octobrists in Contemporary Thailand, and then also last year published in Thai, From Handclappers to Whistleblowers, The Development and Dynamics of the Anti-Taxin Movement. She will be speaking on the White Ribbon Movement, high school students in the Thai youth protests. The screen is yours, uh, Dr. Kanoka. Thank you very much, Tyro. It is my pleasure to be here. And thank you for, oh, sorry. Can you hear me well? Okay, so yeah. I'm gonna start with uh, sharing the screen. Okay, as earlier speaker have already mentioned about several uh, dimensions of the 2020 student movements, particularly uh, the rise of the youth movement last year. Uh, one of the most exceptional of this round of the youth movement that we all have noticed is the youth movement and the political activism and the role of the high school student, as you have already seen in the picture that I have already put on the uh, PowerPoint here. But throughout the 2020, we have been all shocked by these large numbers of the school students taking symbolic action that threatening the core value of the Conservative Norman Institute. All these high school students from various school in Bangkok led a unique protest characterized by using the pop culture like cartoon character, for example, like Ham Taro that you have seen in this character. Uh, and there's an of students in countless number of schools across the country campaigned the three finger salute and tied the white ribbon on their hair, on their clothes, on their belongings to stand in solidarity with the anti-government tester. The student used this three finger gesture to challenge the long standing uh, national ceremony, sacred conservative 
particularly during the morning assembly where the national anthem is sang, is sung. At least, according to the data, at least 200 schools nationwide joined the campaign, either as an individual or the whole school campaign. Uh, we have seen the phenomenon that we haven't seen before, particularly in the southern Thailand. There were several schools in Hat Yai in, in Songkha province, which were the heartland of the yellow shirt and the conservative force in the Thai political history. Uh, and last but not least, on the 1st of December, they successfully staged a nationwide no uniform protest, as you may have seen in several pictures around here. Uh, hundreds of students across the country protest against another conservative and authoritative symbol of the conservative education system that they, were, they have been long forced to wear the uniform to school. By taking this rebellious action in one of the most conservative social institutes, these people have faced a lot of, of violence and a lot of uh, retaliation from their school, from the teachers and the conservative force in their locality. So in order to understand all this phenomenon, what I have done was I went on the on-site interview with around 150 high school students. And in order to fill in their gap of understanding, I also interview about 150 of their university students for the comparative reason. In around nine or 10, about nine provinces throughout the country, in the north, in the south, in the central, and in the northeast, in Bangkok, in suburban area. And I try to understand that how the real participant, particularly high school student, what are they really thinking? Why, why, why they have stood up and, and have done all this uh, political action? Of course, uh, the role of the high school student is not something new in the Thai political history. During the 1973 and 76, so high school students are have played a very active role in supporting the democratic and left-wing student uh, movement. For example, we have seen their network such as the youth, Asayam uh, Youth, Division Sayam, and the National Student School Student Center of Thailand, Sungang Nakli and Hebate Thai, which uh, Ajahn Tong Chai Minichi Kun were also uh, the major, the major, the major uh, member of this two network when he was in the high school. Uh, they campaign against corruption, demand right to participate politically in their school as well as public sphere. And they work with not only with the university student, but they also work with the rural people in Bangkok and also in the rural area. Uh, and at the same time, also recently, we have seen uh, their high school on their right wing movement as well. There were a groups of the high school students supporting the rise of the PAD and the PBRC uh, movement under the, 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 the yellow shirt theme that we have known. Um, and latest one that we have noticed is the rise of the very small but very radical student high school student group called the Revelation of Sayam or the Gum Gansiksa Pluquam Bintai, led by Netiwit and Parichivalak, uh, who later we have all known that they become a very well-known university student uh, activist. However, it's uncomparable to what we have seen during the 2020. What are the differences? I would like to portray this picture. First of all, their demands uh, have been very radical and have threatened the conservative foundation in the way that non the earlier student movement did. Besides demanding for their educational equality, between the rural and urban area, effectiveness of their curriculum to promote the competitive skill or up-to-date knowledge to help them to survive in the disruptive world. They also campaign for personal freedom, social equality, and call for on down and parents to neither put pressure or expect favor from the younger generation is something which have never had before. And above all, they were the major force with the broader movement for reform of the monarchy. And they have become even more radical. 
than the university student. They have publicly criticized monarchy, call for abolition of their limited law and demand for more royal accountability. Even before the Tamasad group did announce the 10 point proposal on monarchy reform. Uh, I went to interview students. I, I remember very well, it was the first interview site that I went in a very small remote provinces in the Northeastern of Thailand. The first thing that I noticed is nearly 90% of them were high school students. And most of the written words on the placard, on the, on the written board that they have, most of them were about the monarchy. This was before the 10th of August, when the, the three 10 proposals have been read by Rung at Tamasa University. Um, this, this is very interesting because when I interview the, uh, the, the university student, majority of them mentions about the reason that why turned them on the street was the dissolution, dissolution of the Future Forward Party and the undemocratic uh, 2017 constitution. These were the motivator for university students to join the protest. On the country, 70, 47 out of 150, 150 high school students that I interviewed for voice their frustration with monarchy and the military as a major reason for them to protest. Uh, I'm, I'm living here with a radical idea that we have seen. Uh, sorry. The radical idea that we have seen. Not only in radicalism that they have went beyond the earlier high school student, but uh, in terms of the or uh, the the network and organization. Uh, the recent rising of the high school student, they successfully developed a strong leadership organization, both at the national and at the local level in the very remote locality in promoting these radical demands. Second, secondary students have developed an extensive national network that built upon a campaign against the Conservative Economic Institute. One of the most outstanding group and one of the very earliest group is called Bad Student. Bad Student in a very good school. Uh, this name has been uh, originated by the book of Nedewit. He has written the book called Bad Student in a Very Good School. And this name has been picked by this group of the student as an inspiration that they term themselves as a bad student and saw time that these schools are in a very are uh, in a very good school. The, the Thai education system is very good, but they are a bad student. In promoting all this num numerous creative, both national and local campaign. Uh, not only one single leading group, we have seen 50, 50 schools, for example, we have seen 50 schools in Bangkok develop a network to support the bad student rally in front of the Ministry of Education, which already have done something that is unbelievable that the earlier generation haven't done. Uh, I remember one of the most remarkable protests that I attend was in front of the Ministry of Education. And uh, actually, initially, they had asked for the Minister of Education to, to meet and have a conversation with the student in order to promote the education reform. But the minister rejected initially to join the platoon to meet the protest. However, later on, the minister, when he changed his mind and decided to appear in the protest, it was too late. The student leader asked, they asked him, uh, asked Mr. Natapon to queue up because he was late. It's impossible if you come er late than other, you would uh, uh, cut the queue and, and speak at the first person. So this, this, was t this was in front of all of the social media and also in public, which is a slapping face on the very top ranking uh, authoritarian authorities in the bureaucratic system, which has never happened before. 
not only this uh, network of in the rally, but also we have seen the regional and the local, the provincial network that different group of those high school students in different provinces has developed. For example, in the north, in the northern Thailand, we have seen the coalition of Lana students, Kirkhan Nakli Lana. While in the southern, we also have the uh, southern student network in Songkha provinces called themselves People's Revolution for Equality and Democracy, and they shortened their name as PRED. In Thai, we call PRED. PRED is mean uh, one of the lowest rank of the ghosts in the in the Buddhist in the Buddhist pram, uh, uh, storytelling when they were young. So that's mean they, they, they satire themselves that we, if you would like to devilize us as a high school student, we are devil and we are the worst devil that you have ever seen. And for another interesting group is the student in Maha Sarakam and Kongen. They, call, they, they organize themselves as a two separate group. The one is Paki, uh, or the Mahasakam student group, and another one is the KKC Paki students. These students, this network have organized rally focused on not just the national issue, but also the local problem. So the question is why? Why all these high school students have broken the taboo and stood up in a very organized and very radical demand? From the interview, I have divided my answer into uh, six categories. The first is very simple and understandable. It was about the school. In this chain, uh, rapid changing, or the younger generation, they have learned a lot, particularly when they have been able to access into the loads and tons of data and information about the problem that they encounter every day. They have a high expectation. Many of the interview uh, told me that they have a very high expectation with the school in order to lay the foundation for the student to be able and ready to tackle with all these challenges. Uh, but instead, the Thai education system has been too long ineffective. They were the big gigantic bureaucratic unit, which is so ineffective. The Ministry of Education was established in 1835, and they have aimed, they aim to produce a loyal and obedient uh, government officer to serve an absolutist state, which is so irrelevant to the current situation for the student who are now facing the, facing the disruptive world in so many aspects. Now today, I um, just would like to give you a bit of idea that how big it is. The Ministry of Education is one of the biggest bureaucratic unit in the Thai government, both in terms of number of staff and also budget. They have 2.2 million civil servants under the Ministry of Education, and they consume an annual budget, which is the highest budget in, the, in, in uh, comparing to other ministries. So even though with this high number of staff and their budget, the, the, the education system of Thailand has been still very top down, unresponsive, outdated curriculum, authoritarian teaching methods based on rote memorization and focusing on forcing the student to conform with the strict rule and hierarchical structure which have remained unchanged for centuries. Several students that I am to interview have frustrated with the authority of the, the uh, they have been very frustrated with the teacher that they have paid more attention on controlling and punishing the student for the dress code and hairstyle violation rather than teaching quality. One of the student, top student in best, uni, best high school in Thailand, Dream uh, Udong Siksa, told, uh, sorry, uh, I have met one of the students in Surin province. She is come with a group of friends with the uh, trip. She has got straight A, but she was very frustrated with the morning class that the teacher spent 45 minutes in measuring your hair, that is not too long. And also they have checked nails and socks and also the underwear that is not too transparent. But when it's come on the academic term, the teacher Perry at 
very little attention in teaching in the school, but they pay more attention in teaching in the special class with the student have to pay extra after class. And this turn, it, it happened also when, my, when I was in the younger generation, but this, those, the school students, they were very aware about how education is very important for them. Why? The second reason is economic in the disruptive world. Unlike the earlier government generation who benefit from the four, and I'm, I'm gonna stop my, my sharing screen. I think it's better to see my face. <laughs> okay, uh, unlike the early generation who have benefited the, the, from the four decades of economic growth, this generation encountered with economic disruption and decline. Many students whom I spoke to complained that education system producing the fact is a factory for producing robot. They said that this kind of skill is, is not the skill that would provide them the adaptability, critical thinking, creativity, the skill that they need to survive in the disrupt, disruptive world. I asked many of them that why you have been so concerned. You are still at high school. This issue is not for the high school student to concern about. The answer, I think more than more than 20 or 30 students out of 150 told me that. Of course, in your generation, you don't care about this. But in my generation, we have to take the, our education loan. They have to take the student loan. So if they choose the wrong subject to study, that's mean they have paid for four years and they are in debt and they have to pay back. And this kind of student loan has just happened during the past 15 years under Thaksin's uh, government that the students are now have better opportunity to get into the higher education. But that's mean they would be in debt immediately when they start the university. So this means they, they turn to become very calculative and become aware and nervous. Anxiety, they have a lot of anxiety about the economic disruption and the quality of the education. Uh, the third is an ineffective and authoritative state. Uh, the corruption and inequality are the key that student is very concerned. After observing the bad student Larry in front of the administration, it, 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 Ministry of Education that I have already told you. I spoke to one female student from one of the best high school which I mentioned earlier, Thriam Udong Saksa. She told me that enjoying the protest because her, her nightmare experience from her primary school in the upcountry, although she was one of the best students in that best primary school in that small province, she graduated with deduction of her behavior score, behavior score after she refused to join the school organized COVID activity, which benefit the administrative staff rather than the student. Her school life and friendship were destroyed by sexual harassment. She experienced some of the teacher who got off scot free. Getting out of the school in, in her province was the only way for her to escape from that nightmare. However, even when she is at Dream Udon, she has become even more frustrated to learn how the inequality of the ed quality of education in the central Bangkok and in the upcountry. So she promised herself that she would join the protest, every protest that she could, both inside and outside her school. The fourth reason is the earlier political activism. This is very interesting. This is not the first time that all majority of these students have joined the political and social activism. 36 of high school students that I interview out of 150, they are, they experience the political act, they, they, they have a long experience with the political activity at school. Either the leader organizing the, the protest against the high school meal and construction corrupted scandal involved administrator and teacher or online petition against the sexual harassment by the school in, the, in, in her own school or even many of them talk about their prime of their online campaigns that are organized by senior students to against the female the male teacher 
they record the evidence on their mobile phone and post their online online to pressure the school administrator to take legal action against their teacher. So, so and countless stories that they have told me about the disobedience campaign against the hair and hair, hair and dress codes rule that they have done long before this political protest. So all, all their students echo the same message that joining the rally outside their school was the next step after that in, in pushing the change after they have already initiated their own political activism inside the school. The last two reason is interconnected. The first is the monarchy and the second is the state violence. I'm gonna focus on the monarchy first. To be honest, I've written this paper in English because I don't think I can write this paper in Thai, at least for my own safety. Um, even though the university and high school student voice similar frustration on uneven development, inequality, corruption, judicial malpractice, ineffective bureaucratic system, monopoly of the capitalism, but their perception on the monarchy are very different. As I've already mentioned, meanwhile, the, the, the university students I interview mostly link that problem with the authoritarian government. 19, uh, 2017 constitution, the long standing pattern and kind system in the bureaucratic system, and the dissolution of the, the, the future forward party. But for the high school student, 48 out of 150, I still in, emphasize on this number, believe that the monarchy is a root cause of the problem and it must be reformed. So I asked the university student that on this phenomenon that can you explain me that why you are different from the high school student? Uh, they, they give me the very interesting three answers. The first is they told me that for the, high, the university student, they have already experienced the election and they have already institutionalized the political institution which was Future Forward Party. So, no, so they have no. heard, yes, all right, I yeah. I, you're over time, so if you cut uh, back. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna short it cut. Okay, Thanks. so Thanks. so they have already give this opinion that there, there were several reasons, for example, they have already insti con insti constitute their uh, political institution and they have not focused the information only on the Twitter, they read more book, newspaper and social media. But for high school students, when I ask them that why, you have to refer this frustration with the monarchy. There were four major reasons that why. The first is after the military coup, they were forced to uh, go for the three major subjects which have never been before in the Thai in the Thai curriculum. The first is the twenty-year national strategy. Second is the king's philosophy, and the last are the citizen's duty, which integrate the king's philosophy and the role of the king and son. Many students become aware how politics is directly relating to them through these courses that turn to become compulsory for the high school and, and, the, the, and the, uh, the high school and primary school student. It, they haven't learned before about the negative information the royal family, but they were forced to memorize all this self-sufficiency economy, and they were forced to write an essay about why they love the king and why, why they love the king and how they love the king and how the king is significant to the monarchy. When they have to write this essay, they went through all the inter internet information and what they have found, they have found extravagance, luxurious lifestyle of the member of the royal pamphlet family online. So this eye opening for this high school student. The second is the contradictory between the low quality of life between them and the royal family. The third just, is the yes, the third is wondering. the can you can you um, can you sum up so that we can have enough time for a discussion? Okay, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, the third is the sexual harassment. The third is the sexual harassment and the fourth is our uh, uh, okay, so the fourth is the uh, state state violence, which uh, particularly the this forced disappearance of one Chalung, Sat uh, Sat Sat Sitka. Okay, thank you, 
thank you so much for, uh, right. for the fascinating paper. And we will have a great discussion. People can ask many more questions. I want to introduce the second speaker and our final speaker of the event, Dr. Duncan McCargo, who is professor of political science at the University of Copenhagen and the director of the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies. He's the author of two recent important books, Fighting for Virtue, Justice, and Politics in Thailand, published by Cornell University Press, and then most recently with Anurat Tatarakun, Future Forward, The Rise and Fall of a Political Party. And he will be speaking on Disruptor's Dilemma, Thailand's 2020 Gen Z protests. The screen is yours, Duncan. Thanks so much, Terrell. It's, it's a huge pleasure to have a chance to, to speak. Um, the paper is out there, and as um, you might have seen in the chat, if you just Google Critical Asian Studies latest articles, you can find all of our articles there. So I try not to talk too much, and since we really want to have more time for discussion, I'm going to concentrate on um, letting us do that and just go very, very quickly through a couple of slides here. So let me do the screen sharing routine, which I'm never very good at. And then... Yes, there we go. Okay, so um, so the paper's called Disruptor's Dilemma, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, I'm trying to understand what is really going on in these protests. My paper is actually the introductory paper for the, the four in this special section. And, um, you know, like AIM, I had the problem that I wasn't able to get to Thailand to do any on the ground field work. So I've been having to rely on what information I could obtain sitting here uh, in my living room in Copenhagen, which is somewhat unsatisfactory. But I try to sketch out a preliminary analysis, interpretation, overview of what's been going on. So you, you've heard a bit of this from Sawani's paper too. We need to think in terms of the protests as, as a couple of waves. I'm trying to concentrate on what I call the student inspired protests. Now this is tricky because which protests were in fact the student inspired ones. There is this wonderful website, uh, mobdatathailand.org. I'll, I'll send you the link later. It's at the end of my slides, uh, which has been put together by Amnesty International and ILAW. And there you can see details about all the protests that took place in Thailand in 2020. And that's, they're continuing to update it into 2021. So that's one of my prime sources of reference. The problem with mob data is wonderful. The problem is uh, they keep adding more information and we still are, are well aware of things that are not in there that should really be in there. So every number, that I have to work with this provisional because you can go back into mob data probably now or tomorrow and find that the figures have changed very slightly. But you know, all of these figures are, are somewhat understated. But we have a first wave of flash mobs that started right after my birthday, 21st of February last year, when the Future Forward Party, the aforementioned, was banned. And those flash mobs, as we've heard, petered out. Um, there was, of course, the emergency decree that clamped down on political protest um, as a result of COVID. But actually, if we look at the mob data figures, the um, protests had petered out by around the 14th of March. There wasn't much going on by the time the emergency decree was actually issued, partly because of COVID and maybe the, that particular wave of the protests was burning out. But what's very interesting about these protests, we've heard a bit about Isan already, is that unlike many previous rounds of protests that we're familiar with, which were largely concentrated in Bangkok and in the capital, um, the protests last year have actually affected at least 62 provinces based on what we have from mob data. I did this visualization, quite pleased with myself, so I've never done a visualization before. And you see, um, you, you have to have two protests in order to, to get into this visualization, because if we put all 62 in, it becomes so confusing, you can't really make much sense out of it. But what looms very large in the visualization is, you know, the bigger the the bigger the words, uh, the more protests and college towns, um, provinces immediately around Bangkok, the five provinces surrounding Bangkok, major cities, places where there are universities. These are where protests were concentrated, but they're in the south as well. They're in every part of the country uh, and very, very large numbers of them in central Thailand and northeast Thailand, and quite a lot in the north. So this is what's extremely remarkable about these protests. It's very wide ranging. And then we have the second wave of protests, um, which is a wave that starts in the middle of July and goes on 
to the end of the year. And as we've heard, there's a peaking of protest that takes place in October with 127. So you see there's a, a dramatic rise and fall of the protests. Trying to understand what these protests are about in terms of who's behind them becomes very difficult. We've heard about the, the free groups, for example, and some of the other groups whose names seem to reflect particular political orientations that the Rasadon uh, groups, uh, some others that call themselves no dictatorship, sometimes both in English and Thai, for democracy, uh, student coalitions, liberals with the word Seri in their title, campus student groups. But overall, what, what you see when you try to take out the names of the groups that are listed in mob data, uh, focusing on that July the 18th to the December 31st period is a rainbow of groups, not uh, the dominance of any one particular group. And of course, a number of the protests were co-sponsored, co-organized by different groups. And of course, if you talk to people in the provinces and the vicinities, many of them will tell you that, well, actually, many of the same people were involved in the different groups and the distinctions that we're trying to create between the different groups are somewhat uh, simplistic and somewhat arbitrary. So there's a real problem when we try to examine what exactly is going on in terms of the orientation of the people behind the groups. But what's very apparent is that this is not a single coherent, consistent uh, organization by any stretch of the imagination. And some of these colors, of course, also reflect alliances with other kinds of groups, former red shirt groups, groups that were active in opposing the military in the post coup period. And then of course, people from livelihood related, environment related and other issues who at certain points have pragmatically or otherwise joined in these protests in particular parts of the country or traveled to Bangkok to join them. So this makes it incredibly difficult to work out what exactly is going on uh, in the protest because there are really so many different kinds of people involved and just from the mob data which is as i say understated um getting on for 400 protests taking place in 62 provinces across during the course of the year okay so what is going on here here i am I confess, overly obsessed, perhaps, with the notion of generational uh, conflict. I am very convinced that one of the most interesting developments in Thailand over the past few years is a development that has parallels with what's happened in Hong Kong and with other places around the world. It's the emergence of Generation Z, as I would call it, or Generation Z, um, if I'm on the other side of the Atlantic, movements of people under 25 who many informants keep telling me have a very very different understanding of the world from people who are only a few years older to me all of these people seem ridiculously young but if you are in your 20s many people tell me they can see a dramatic difference between those who are say 28 29 and those who are 22 23 in terms of their thinking and their affinity with what we might call digital nativity the people who've really grown up on the internet, who didn't start off as I did by reading books and at some point migrate to gain access to information online. They're in a very, very different mindset and different mode of operation. I started to think about this a lot during the, the Future Forward book, um, which was just mentioned when I was trying to understand how the Future Forward party became so popular and won 6.3 million votes, many of them from these younger people. Uh, one of the original leaders of the, the youth wing of the Future Forward party, um, Nana Wong Sawai, is a very, very interesting figure who later herself left the party, uh, explained to me in an early interview in 2018 that, that the Future Forward party was created to oppose what she called Aosoniyam or senioritism. The, the purpose of the party was to overturn deference, to challenge elders, and to tell people that they have no right to be respected just because of their greater age. Um, this was something that, you know, that I picked up a couple of years before these protests began, but it's very much a theme in the protests, and especially, of course, in the high school protests that, that Knockrat was just talking about, this idea of overturning hierarchy as an organizing principle. 
Of course, we have all these discussions about ideology that are sort of floating around out there. Um, is this a case of revolution rather than reform, as we uh, came across in that famous slogan projected uh, onto the stage on the 10th of August? But even if we listen to the, to the rhetoric of the, the student leaders at the time and the, the pronouncements that were issued, the sort of implicitly revolutionary critical references to monarchy and so on are always carefully framed within a, a much softer language of reform, of engagement with constitutionalism. And even though there are clearly some very radical ideas present in this movement, it's hard to see um, an ideological consistency of the kind that we saw, say, in the 1970s. And I think this, in this sense, I'm very much in agreement with what Jan Tongshai was, was saying yesterday. We don't really see a convincing um, profile of people who seem to be dedicated to, to revolution or something of that kind. What kind of revolution is it? It's not very well articulated. And if you watch uh, those now very readily available and fascinating because since I've not been able to go to Thailand, YouTube has become my, my main research site and I'm trying to do this digital ethnography by watching lots and lots of recorded interviews with people like the student leaders. You don't get very much sense from them that they imagine themselves as revolutionaries or even as particularly radical in the sense that we might have imagined those terms in previous decades. Um, they actually talk about forming new political parties and their ideas of working with the system for positive change in ways that are actually relatively conservative in certain respects. So if this is not an ideological movement for revolution, despite appropriating some uh, radical rhetoric and flirting with those ideas, of course, talking about monarchy, which is sort of inherently revolutionary, but doesn't necessarily lead us to a completely revolutionary position. What's actually really going on here? And the argument of the paper is that this appears to be a movement that's primarily about narrative disruption, about changing the way we talk about problems, about transforming uh, people's understanding of hierarchy so that they can engage in more critical debates about the monarchy, about previously unmentionable sacred cows and of course that goes right down to the all the, the representatives of power and authority at lower levels down to school teachers uh, school principals and the like and this leads us to this question of you know what what would winning involve for these um, protesters what does victory look like and there are lots of interviews with leaders of the protests basically saying we've already won and this was part of the conversation that, that Tong Shai and I were having in response to some of the questions yesterday is it already victory once you can start talking about the monarchy once you can start casting aside the implicit and explicit um, language and behavior associated with deference have you already achieved you know, if it's not a revolution as we would conventionally understand it in historical or, or political terms, but you've achieved such a disruption of people's values and understandings that you've already won, and you therefore don't need to, to do anything very much more, because the, the main goal has been achieved. Once you can come out in the open and talk about things that you previously couldn't talk about, then victory is already yours, and it doesn't matter uh, if the protests are suppressed, if some of the leaders go to jail, and so forth. This is one way of understanding what's happening. I think it's a, a very, very interesting idea. I'm not totally convinced that it's completely true. I would be a lot happier if the leaders of the movement were able to be more unified in promoting certain goals. We're in an ironic situation where the government is extremely unpopular, where the economy is a disaster, and there are so many to use one of those ghastly uh, cliches, low hanging fruit that a protest movement could be focused on in order to take the narrative disruption further to a disruption of the political order. Uh, of course, for many of the student leaders, the monarchy is the primary goal and there's no doubt at all that the monarchy is absolutely at the core of you know, all roads lead to monarchy in Thailand. You can't solve any problem without in some way beginning to address it. The question is whether you can address the monarchy problem by going directly to it or whether you might want to try and take down some of the individuals, organizations, institutions which are 
enabling and protecting and facilitating the way in which the monarchy works in order then to expose the monarchy itself and whether in order to do that you might want to build a broad coalition of people given that there are huge numbers of people in Thailand who are dissatisfied with the government and dissatisfied with their economic circumstances very frustrated after Covid very frustrated about all kinds of things that have been going on in the society and there are in many respects um, they're not engaged in, in hyper-royalism in the way that they were in the previous reign. They are ripe for, if not complete radicalization, a degree of mobilization. Could you reach out to people in the center ground? Because the success of Future Forward and the ability of Tanatorn and co to gain 6.3 million votes in that 2019 election was that they were able to depict themselves as orange, as neither yellow nor red, and try to appeal to people on both sides in a, in a kind of softer middle ground to rally around their cause. And this is something that the movement hasn't been doing. Um, could it do that uh, without selling out and, and turning into some sort of parody of itself, which is obviously what the leadership fears? So those, I think, are the very interesting questions that could be explored. Um, so if you have any questions, please send them to me and um, do take a look at our articles. Um, they are out there and elaborate our points in a bit more detail. The Mob Data Thailand uh, website is great. Um, I'm trying to work on tabulating some more of the stuff that they have and putting it out in a slightly more accessible form because it, it, they really do a, a protest by protest discussion and not very much overview. And these great photographs uh, cannot have got for us to, to use in a special issue, but alas, we weren't able to. So I thought I would show them today, but they are by uh, Gan Sung Tong of the, the Mob Data team. So thanks very much. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Duncan. So now we have we've got almost, we've got about twenty five minutes for discussion with both of these panelists. So please keep putting your questions into the Q and A. And I'd like to start with a question from Adan Kim Tong for Adan Kanokrat, uh, in which he asks. Uh, first, how is the campaign to abandon the uniform now? It seems that the students could not sustain the campaign and eventually, shortly after, they gave up and returned to wearing the uniform. Second, can you emphasize on those students who are expelled from home? I know that one just recently committed suicide. Can most of them return to family? Uh, in, in responding to the first question, I probably have a different perspective about this. Uh, it, we have to understand first that what are what were the the high school students fought for? Or they were fought for the the uh, strict rule and uh, violence against the student in the name of the dress code and the hairstyle. So what they have campaigned on the first of December, they have already successfully. Uh, asked the Minister of Education to emphasize on the new rule on under the constitution about the political and social freedom. And it has been stressed already by the Minister of Education that there is no strict regulation for the, for the student to wear the, universe, the uniform in, in the sense that the, uni, that the school used the very strict and violence against the student when they have missed the, the regulation on the, on the universe of the uniform. So I interviewed some of the students after this year and many of them say they have already won, at least they, they have already successfully campaigned against this and they have already made this as a public agenda and many of the school have already stepped back in using the violence and strict rule on this. So, for them, they didn't a campaign only to take out the, uni the uniform. Many of them were very happy about the uni uniform that they don't have to think about what to wear at, at the school. So, so yes, they, it have been different from, from what we had expect that eventually all of the university, a high school student would wear the, the, the private the private uniform, but no, they, they have partly successful on this. And for the student who have been either abandoned the home or has been asked by the parents to leave home, these we have record countless, several hundreds of cases that the many students have either decided to leave home or parents asked them to leave 
Uh, uh, actually, for the long run, I think the situation will getting better. This what remind me about the initial stage when the yellow shirt and red shirt create a lot of conflict inside the family. And that time at the initial stage, I remember there were a lot of divorce between wife and husband. There were a lot of broken home because of this political polarization. I think we are, the family are at the state of shock about this rebellious uh, sense of the school student. But gradually after this become normalization as Duncan have already mentioned, they have really successfully disrupted the idea about the conservative idea about in Thailand. So in the in this near future, I think parents are getting better and they, they're gonna understand this. But the difference between the conflict under yellow shirt and this round is youth or the student, they are, have been far more vulnerable than the red shirt or yellow shirt adult. So they have lesser and lesser buffer in order to tolerate this kind of pressure from the family. So, so we have to take in care of them. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this question is for Duncan and it is a question from Hannah Thompson who asks, how do you create cohesion and long-standing revolutionary leaders when they are consistently targeted and imprisoned currently without bail? How can that constant breaking up of organizers be solved within the movement? Yeah, no, that, that is obviously very difficult. And that's clearly something that the authorities have decided to do very, very deliberately to, to make the movement dramatically less effective. So that is a big part of the problem. I guess the question is whether, you know, the other interesting part of it, though, is that for a long time, people were being bailed out and were literally going straight from court back to, to being on the protest stage again. And to me, that was also kind of an, an extraordinarily bizarre phenomenon where over and over again, uh, people would be bailed out supposedly on condition that they were not going to engage in any political activity and their political activity would begin the second they walked uh, out of the courtroom. Uh, so there was clearly a signal from somewhere to, to change the policy. And we have to assume that the signal comes from very much the, you know, the top of the Thai state um, to do this. But it's not as though, so for, for a long time, the leaders were just being released and were able to meet and talk, but they weren't in agreement even then. So yes, it, what's being done to them, I, I would completely, you know, condemn it's appalling but because these are political crimes and they're, they're not real crimes at all everybody knows that they're being charged with with completely specious uh, made up crimes right but even before they were being locked up on the basis of the specious made up crimes it's not as though they had a coherent it's not as though their their coherence has been disrupted by um the justice process and the repression alone because they didn't have a, a, a amongst themselves complete agreement about what it was they were trying to achieve so this is the problem. Are they actually engaged in a revolution? What kind of revolution are we talking about here? Um, if you want to bring down the monarchy, you know, Lom Jiao, uh, how would you do that? Are you going to engage in an armed struggle? Uh, are you going to get the military on your side? Well, they haven't been doing a very good job of getting the military on their side. Uh, would you do that by building a broad consensus for a change in Thailand's political system? Well, they haven't really been doing that either. So it's difficult to see what kind of revolutionary struggle um, they are engaged in, in that sense. We know what they're against and we know what they're trying to do, but isn't the revolution actually basically, uh, it's, it is a revolution of disrupting people's thought processes, narratives, ideas, and understandings more than a practice. It's, it, it's not a practical revolution at this stage. Maybe it becomes one at some point, but at the moment, the, the revolution is a kind of an intellectual or um, rhetorical or performative revolution rather than a revolution as we would most typically understand it. Maybe this is, a, I mean, I'm not really into these postmodernist explanations, but it's a very 21st century kind of revolution that these leaders are engaging in. And bear in mind, a number of the people who are being locked up are not students at all, of course, and some of them are, are older than me. So uh, it, it is a movement that has quite a complicated leadership of people who come from different perspectives and different backgrounds who brought their various ideas uh, into it. But there's no way that the, if we were to name the, the 20 or so leading figures in this movement, there's no way they could really sit down and agree about exactly what it was that they're 
that they're trying to use as a strategy. They might be able to agree about a number of things that they very, very strongly dislike, but that's sort of the easy part of these movements. How do, how do we get from knowing what we dislike to getting rid of it? Um, that, that has been disrupted by locking people up, but it's not like before they were locked up, they had the answer to that either. Thank you. Uh, Duncan's response makes me want to ask a question very much you about can, you can, that would be fun, the meeting. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I actually, I think I am going to use my, my chair's prerogative to ask you both. In this moment, what does revolution look like? What does reform look like from, your, from where you're standing? And maybe um, start with Adan Kanokrat and then come back to you, Duncan. We can't hear you. You're Sorry. Muted. You asked that what is the revolution and reform for this youth, right? I have yeah, asked from, your, from my yeah. perspective, on for their perspective. Yeah. From your perspective, uh, I agree with Duncan on one one aspect that our last year it was the movement of disruption, disrupt the ideas and the core value, the norm. But for the revolution and reform, I still haven't seen the clear pro long term project. I have talked to many leaders and the participants. This is something that they, they haven't have that much clear idea. For the leader themselves, they have a different and very diverse contesting ideas about how to achieve the reform, how to achieve the revolution. Or many of them, they even not even think about revolution or only reform or it's different group are now talking about the socialism, communism. So, so they have been, uh, I think for me, to give them a benefit of doubt, to give them the benefit of doubt, they are in the changing world. And it's very hard for them to think about how to change the society in the different way from the earlier social movement, what the red shirt have done, what the yellow shirt have done, what the earlier, earlier generation have done, it haven't made any change. So for them, they are struggling in order to find a way to uproot it or changing the, the system that is unbearable for them. For them, for, of course, one of the things for them that they have all, they could not bear to stand with this kind of society anymore. There was a campaign that if we have money, we would leave the country among the younger generation. So what does it mean? Many of them ask me that. If you ask me this question of how to make a revolution, it should be your generation that you have already done this, but you fail. Why you ask me how to make this revolution in this very strong, gigantic, bureaucratic Thai state? For me, it is 80 years of the long, 88 years of the long civil war in Thailand since 1932. There were so many rounds of back and forth between this kind of effort to make a revolution. This is another round. It may be or maybe not change the whole system. And you have to understand the Thai state. Now, I have seen several questions. For me now, Thai state have been one of the strongest, the most penetrative uh, Thai state that we have never seen before, either in terms of horizontal or vertical in terms of budget or the strength, the unity. So this means this generation are facing one of the most unified Thai conservative states. So for them, the question is far more difficult than what we have seen in earlier generation. I may be exaggerate, but that's what I have seen from, from, from them. Yeah, um, well, there's something in what you say. I mean, at the end of my Network Monarchy article, I think I said the monarchy was in a state of profound weakness. You know, if you have to stage two military coups and you have to have a violent crackdown on protesters in 2010, and then you have to have the legitimacy of the current reign completely undermined by a bunch of high school students, you're actually in an enormous amount of trouble and you can appropriate all kinds of powers to yourselves and, and, and get these water cannon and, and use any kind of repressive legislation you like. But the more you have to do that, the more clear it is that you have no legitimacy. So the state may look stronger in certain respects, but its legitimacy over the last 15 years has almost completely evaporated if we think about the, the high watermark of the, of the 60th anniversary of 2006. The Thai state has, has very, very low legitimacy now amongst large numbers 
of people. And that's something that probably wasn't the case um, in any, any other recent period. So there's a kind of paradox about the whole thing. But yeah, revolution has, as, as we conventionally understood it, has failed. Uh, and then you're left with reform. You know, I edited a book about political reform, uh, the 1997 process and so on. Uh, and then, of course, the discourse of reform was appropriated by uh, the PDRC. It's Patti Hu, Kong, Gan, Lek, Bang. You know, we have, we're going to reform before we have an election. You remember that slogan? So you can't any longer use the word reform with a straight face. It's just laughable. The word reform has no, has no sort of credible meaning to people in Thailand anymore. So we've, we've run out of options. Like there's no, there's no obvious kind of revolution that people could have and there's no reform that people can really believe in. And yes, on the one hand, you have this entrenched power of the state. But the thing that is, you know, like the, this is why my paper in the special issue ends optimistically. In the long run, the legitimacy has gone. So it doesn't really matter, you know, on one level, uh, nobody believes in them anymore or, or the number of people who believe in them is very, very much reduced from previously. So that they, the old assumptions of um, royalist nationalism that everybody or a significant majority of the population bought into a set of national myths are assumptions that don't hold. Uh, and that is dramatic. And that is, it, it, maybe we can't exactly call it a revolution or reform in our conventional terms, but it's an extraordinary paradigm shift that has taken place. Uh, can I add up something on top of Duncan? Uh, yes, I would like to ask this to Duncan as well, uh, because our, for me this year, the Thai state, even though in the wrong run, the legitimacy crisis, crisis is a way to, for them. But this year for me, are the state is very, very strong looking at how they respond to the different pressure groups. Mm -hmm. Besides students, they all respond. They respond to Bangroy book today. They respond to the, the, the land, the, the, the debt network, the, the small scale farmer mm -hmm. today. They respond to all any other groups besides students. None of the education reform have put on the table throughout the year, throughout the, 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 the protest, none of the reaction or respond to the student demand at all. So, so of course, the legitimacy crisis there, but what does it mean? This means it's impossible to make any revolution or any reform, only the student movement. It's impossible for this, for this era. Because this, for me, at the moment, the state is very unified, very tolerant. The, 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 the capital, the business group, the military and the monarchy are very unified. They are strong than ever. So in order to, to against their illegitimate power, it has to be alliance between other generation, not only the younger. And if we have seen, I am not opt pessimistic, I'm quite optimistic. For me, this year, of course, the student movement will decline and lose, at least during the next three or four months, because now is the, is getting closer to the summer holiday. The, the student movement will revive in, October, in September, October, when the school open again. So at the moment, it's very hard to save Penguin or to save any of those in the jail. But uh, in the protest, there were, there were uh, statistics have done the, the survey, the informal survey. Actually, majority of the participants in the protest, not they were not the generation Z, but they were generation mm -hmm. Y, majority of the participants in the protest. So this mean, we are now waiting for the rise of other generation. And we are talking about the disruptive economy of the pandemic of the COVID, which will, which is coming. Now it is not at the end of the bottom yet, as many have already mentioned. So we have to wait for other groups and other generation, not only the student movement. Thank you. This is a great, this is a great exchange. Uh, I wanted to raise a question uh, from Ganda Naknoi, who asks to both of you, 
Currently, high school students in Thailand are campaigning for postponing the standardized exam. I found that it is very strange that they did not seem to get much support from the bad student movement and the free youth. It seems like this is a missed opportunity, especially for bad student, the bad student movement. Does this mean that the bad student movement was mostly rhetorical? So maybe start, start with Duncan and then. Okay, yeah. Um... I don't know. I, I, I must admit this this is a, an issue that's beyond my um, immediate area of expertise here. It's hard from a distance to measure it. But yeah, it, it does seem to me to sort of illustrate a problem that if you want to have an effective movement, you need to form alliances with people who are coming from slightly different places, but who could agree with your core agenda. And it's another illustration of, of how a potential set of alliances might be, be lost. But I think... Um, Yin can probably tell us the, the real story behind the scenes here. When I've heard about this, it's made me think about so many earlier examples of how the youth group, I, I, know, I should not use the word of youth, but the student groups, mm. that they have made decision or push forward several campaign or did, them, did not push the campaign. That our generation have expected. Mm. They have done something that so contradicts, so so different from, from my, my idea. So mm. many academics uh, who have kept an eye on the protest. For example, like Free Youth, when they post the Restart Thailand and use a symbol of the, the hammer and the, what is it? The Hon Kiawa in English. Mm. Yeah, the symbol of uh, communism. And use, uh, yes, and use the words of communism. Mm -hmm. I still I remember from the very first hour, they were bombarded by academics throughout the world about this campaign. But surprisingly, it's draw a lot of attention from the youngster. Mm -hmm. And they, when I interviewed the leader, they, they have a long debate about that, how they look at this different from us, which I mean, I mean, it's very hard. It, we should not judge them just yet on what they do or they don't do. The, this, this younger generation, this university student, they have been at high school student, they have been very calculative. For me, from my experience, they have been very highly calculate on what are they do. So, so I don't judge them, whether it's a right or wrong moment for the protest. I have to say, the more I listen, the more hopeful I feel about, about the future. <laughs> um, I want to be here, so I have to be very optimistic. <laughs> I want to pull a few, there's a, a bunch of questions about the educational system as a whole, so I want to pull them together and ask both of you to respond, which is that, what has the response of educational institutions been? How have high schools responded, administrators, teachers, and in the cases where the schools and the Ministry of Education has been unresponsive, is that going to work in the long term, or are they going to have to change in order to survive? What uh, what do you what do you both think? Let's start with uh, Kanokrat and then move to move to Duncan. Uh, first of all, not only Ministry of Education. Now I have been invited to talk with several governmental officers. All of them haven't been aware <laughs> that they have to change. They still have that kind of certain belief that they still be able to survive without changing, at least for the short term survival. I have never seen anyone are willing to make any change or improvement for the short run, at least for this year and next year. They still haven't seen, got any signs. So if you ask that, is there any hope about the education reform? I say, yes, of course then is, is the great moment then never ever for me. One, the first reason I have heard from Ajahn Atapona, he is a lecturer at the education uh, at Chula. Uh, we have changed in the demographic. The, there is a demographic change in the bureaucratic system in Thailand, particularly in the next few years. Uh, for example, in the education ministry, now is the big round of change nearly million staff will retire now and very soon. 
And because of the high salary that have just been increased during the past 10 years, it's become a very attractive for the young, bright student. Ajahn Atipon told me that there have been a statistic that the younger generation are now willing, they are more than eager to pursue the education in education department. For example, like in July, mm -hmm. the score is a lot higher. In latter part, the education uh, faculty become the top, the top in the rank. So this means we are now having the better, brighter, younger generation in the education in the education system. And they are now in the next 10 years, it's not easy, but in the next 10 years, this generation will dominate the, the Ministry of Education. Not only Ministry of Education, in many others as well. In the security bureaucratic system, for example, like uh, uh, the Security Council with a small one, 300 staff, and now nearly 50% of them are lower than 30 years old. So, so we are now have seen the change. If we don't change now, there's no other moment in the Thai political history of the bureaucratic system. So, so this is the changing moment for me. So I'm quite hopeful and wishful. <laughs> Probably Dan can have different idea. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's it's not an issue that I've gone into in 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 nearly enough depth. To be able to say with confidence uh, but yes it is very interesting and of course with this economic downturn secure jobs like school teaching are going to become more attractive so there is a kind of a, a, a reification of that uh, public sector culture if some more capable people are going to go into it but yes of course um what can i say it's it's all about virtue isn't it the teachers believe that they're good people and so they're you know the, the problem is that the student and this is the the bad students thing you sort of parody yourself as bad students because uh, that's the only way that you can ridicule the idea that the educational institutions have of themselves as being fountains of virtue it's parallel to the judges uh, but they're also fighting for virtue teachers are fighting for virtue to assert their to my mind you know, extremely muddled notion of what moral values and correct behavior should be upon a, a young generation in order to create the right kind of society uh, in a very, very conservative way. And it's extremely hard for them to admit that they've spent, uh, you know, the past 20 or 30 lives, the years of their lives completely barking up the wrong tree. Uh, they're not going to, uh, they're going to see this behavior by the students as just yet another example of indiscipline that needs to be resolved uh, and students need to be brought back on board to righteousness and, and orderliness uh, in the same way that they always have seen it. It's going to take a lot more than this to shake uh, the foundations of the education ministry. And in that sense that, you know, someone should really study more about the education ministry. Um, it's a fascinating entity. One of my PhD students wrote about it a few years ago. Um, in many ways, it's parallel to the monarchy, to the military, to the judiciary, to the interior ministry as a fount of uh, conservative understanding about what Thailand's all about. So if you haven't shaken the monarchy and the military, then you probably won't shake the, the education ministry either. In some ways, it's even more conservative. Hate to say. That is, uh, I think that's a good place for us to end. We're about to hand the floor back to Duncan to conclude the whole event, but just to flag, if there's any, if there are any MA or PhD students listening, that was that was just a sign for another another thesis that needs to be needs to be written if you're looking around for a topic. So thank uh, thank you so much, Duncan and Kanopat, and uh, I hand the screen to Duncan. Thanks so much, Terrell, and thanks so much, Ian, for, for being with me on that panel and everybody for, for speaking and asking questions and joining in the uh, sessions for the past couple of days. I found this a really, really enjoyable event. I was somewhat dreading the idea of having a Thailand Update conference without being able to be physically present at Columbia University and uh, look down from the 15th floor of the International Affairs Building, as I mentioned yesterday, but actually it has worked out surprisingly well. I have to thank Athena Fontenot and uh, Sydney Easley from the Weather Heady Station Institute for all the great work they've done to make this happen. It's been absolutely fabulous working with them uh, as always, as well as my colleagues at the New York Southeast Asia Network and the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies. So we will continue. Um, whatever happens in 2022, we will find a way to have some version of the Thailand Update Conference again and to carry forward what uh, has become 
quite a, a lively and, and interesting tradition. Now, yesterday we started a new tradition because we were unable to have a physical uh, lunch gathering or coffee break or reception. We had a virtual reception. So we're now going to do the same thing again. Uh, people were not all convinced it would work and you're absolutely free to leave it at any time. But if you'd like to look in your emails, you should have received recently another reminder email from Athena, um, which directs you back to the virtual room, which is a bit different from, you've been in a, a webinar up to now, you're going to go back into a, um, a normal Zoom room where you see everybody. So everybody will see your face and name. And then from there, we'll break into groups. You'll hang out with another five people in a group for 10 minutes and then come out of those groups and go and meet somebody else. So it's like a real reception in the sense that you'll meet, you'll bump into people, you, some of whom you know and some of whom you don't know. If you find uh, that you don't particularly want to hang out in the room that you are in, you're welcome to go back to the main room by leaving not zoom but leaving uh, the room that you're in and then we can put you into a different room if you like to talk to some different people but if you wait 10 minutes you'll find you're rotated anyway so last last night we tried it and uh, we went four rounds and there was still this almost the same number of people after four rounds as, as when we started so let's uh, try to use this opportunity to have some of the informal conversation that we haven't been able to have as a result of this format so everybody please click on your um, your next Zoom link, and I hope to see as many of you as there as possible. Thanks so much for joining the Thailand Update 2021. Bye-bye.